MRD, of course, refers to minimal residual disease assessment, and we're going to get into an extensive discussion about that uh, later in, in our uh, discussion here today. Well, let's turn and talk a little bit about uh, induction therapy, and typically for induction therapy, we uh, divide our patients into whether they're BCRABL positive, have the Philadelphia chromosome or not, or whether, uh, and if they do not, then we approach those patients differently. And I'd like to make a few comments about how we approach uh, Philadelphia chromosome or BCRABL positive uh, uh, acute uh, lymphoblastic leukemia. I think the game changer in the treatment of this subtype of ALL has been the, the tyrosine kinase inhibitors that were first developed for chronic myeloid leukemia and now are an established therapy for Philadelphia chromosome uh, a positive uh, ALL. And certainly imantinib has been the, the first agent that was tested in this uh, uh, subset of patients. But most of the tyrosine kinase inhibitors have now been tested in, in one form or uh, another. Um, our pediatric colleagues have relied primarily on the use of imantinib, and uh, some of their studies have uh, suggested that if uh, a pediatric patient with pH-positive ALL achieves MRD negativity, becomes BCR-ABL negative, that uh, they don't appear to need a transplant, and their outcomes uh, are similar to what's uh, seen with either a matched related or matched unrelated. Uh, a donor. I think we still don't know that uh, with certainty in our adult uh, patients, uh, and it's something that uh, we should uh, discuss. Um, the initial approach to treating these patients was to add a tyrosine kinase inhibitor to our established chemotherapy regimens, and that's still what, what many of us do. <coughs> the, uh, the Italians have taken an interesting uh, approach. Uh, in uh, relying on a, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor with corticosteroids along with some CNS prophylaxis, but use that as a sole therapy uh, in elderly, but even in, in younger patients, and have shown that they can achieve a high uh, rate of complete hematologic response with lower levels of complete molecular uh, response. I know their initial studies were with the satinib, and they uh, had a complete molecular remission around 20%. Uh, there's uh, a new study from their group that was presented at this year's ASH meeting uh, where they've uh, added panotinib to uh, corticosteroids uh, and are showing even better responses, uh, complete hematologic responses over 90% and molecular responses approaching uh, 40%. Uh, so it's really a very exciting time in the treatment of this poor prognosis uh, ALL. Um, well, speaking of panatinib, uh, MD Anderson has shown some very compelling data adding panatinib to hypercevad mm -hmm. uh, with uh, one-year survival upwards of 70, 75 percent. Uh, of course, we'll need to see longer-term outcome data from that study um, and, and probably hopefully see it done in a multi-institutional setting. Um, because with the hypercevad desatinib study, we did see some later relapses. But panatinib seems to have particularly robust uh, activity in ALL, uh, which is uh, great for this patient population. So if we can add it to backbones like hypercevad or other regimens and get outcomes that um, rival those that we see in children, then um, perhaps we don't need to transplant the pH positive population anymore. Right. I think that's, I, I, again, you bring up some very compelling points. I'm, I'm you know, I'd, I'm, I would like you to comment on the uh, the Alliance trial that's coming. That I think we'll be testing this approach. Uh, if I understand correctly, it's going to be a low dose chemo versus a, a, like a steroid vincristine combination, plus spry cell versus a chemotherapy. It's I think a hypercevad backbone with for, uh, with a spry cell uh, to actually formally test. Um, do we need the high-dose induction chemo? And if we see a positive result, should we extrapolate that to panatinib? I mean, are we, are we at that stage where we can say that with each generation of TKIs, we need to be ready to, to, to push it forward? I mean, this, this is particularly relevant as ABL001 is now sort of making its foray into the clinical trial space. Yeah. Anthony, what's your perspective on so the question, question of the different... Um, I mean, the goal, the goal, uh, the goal of uh, treatment is to get a complete molecular response. So when you combine either the satinib or panatinib with steroids alone, 
you're only getting a complete molecular response. The most is 45%. So most of those patients are going to relapse in the future. And even if, you're, even if your goal is to take them to a transplant, most patients will do better if they come into a transplant uh, molecularly negative prior to the transplant. So I, have a, I, st I still don't uh, buy into the concept of using, uh, of using uh, steroids and a TK inhibitor alone, and will often even add a little bit of uh, chemotherapy to the regimen. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, some tried, of the, yeah. well, some of the patients in whom you might consider steroids with a TKI alone would be patients that may not be fit yeah, for I mean, transplant. For, yeah. And yeah. so, so um, that calculus about uh, getting them to MRD negativity specifically for improving the outcome of transplant may not be quite as relevant. Yeah. Uh, but certainly in those, in those patients, you want to have the best prog progression-free survival of your initial therapy because that's really what they're relying on without a consolidative transplant. No, for, for an elderly patient, I have uh, no problem giving them steroids and a TK inhibitor because they're able to tolerate the treatment. You can get them into a, at least a hematological remission and you can prolong their survival.